So hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I am Joey Posada, I use he, they pronouns, and this is my colleague Penny Maybe, she, her pronouns, and our colleague Janelle Hall, she, her pronouns. Uh, she is joining us today and will be supporting as technical support. Um, I do see a few of you that were in our last session, so we're excited to have you again today. Um, and, you know, this is the second of two trainings designed to give attendees the skills to successfully plan and execute external board and advisory group meetings. Uh, so before we get too deep into all of the good stuff, I wanted to just give Janelle an opportunity to talk a little bit about Zoom and how we're going to be using it today. Thanks, Joey. Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, like Joey said, my name is Janelle Hall and I go by she, her pronouns and I'm your technical support person today. So if you have any technical issues raising your hand or getting your microphone to be heard or having any issues annotating on Zoom, you can message me privately um, and I, I'll also drop my cell phone in the chat so that you can give me a call if anything big comes up and you want someone to walk you through it. Um, and to get us started, I just wanted to give a little primer on Zoom so that you know all of the, the different tools and different buttons we'll be using today to make sure that you can be really actively engaged in this interactive session. Um, so for starters, you're probably in the full screen version of Zoom. Um, if you're having trouble finding floating buttons, you can always go to the top and um, exit full screen. And then um, no matter what view you're in, you should at the bottom of your screen see this black bar that we're referring to here. Um, so just to walk you through some of the buttons, here you have the mute to unmute button. Um, when our facilitators call on you after you raise your hand, you can mute and unmute yourself. Um, and we ask that you stay muted when you're not speaking to reduce any background noise. Um, I know we have a lot going on at home, so if you can mute, we can avoid some of the loud noises in the background. Um, and if possible, we ask you to wear headbuds or earphones so that we can reduce the background noise when you're speaking as well. And then right beside that, we have the start video button. You can turn your video on and off. And whenever possible, we'd love to have you, love to see your face as we're interacting in these conversations and going into breakout rooms to have that face-to-face -face connection. So if you're able, um, please turn on video. And if not, no worries. We also have the participants menu, so you can click on that and you'll see a little box pop up that shows you all of the participants here today. Um, the participants menu is also where you will access the raise hand button. And so our facilitators will provide opportunities for you to speak out loud and they'll ask you to raise your hand, um, which is this little raise hand button in the bottom of the participants menu and that'll allow us to call on you in order and have an active discussion. We also have the chat box, so you can pop that open um, and chat with other folks. You can leave questions in there for the facilitators, comments for the facilitators, or you can message me privately to resolve any technical issues. Um, so that about covers the controls that you all have. Um, and just as a final note, if you all lose connection, um, you can always rejoin at the, the link that you used to get in here today. That's your unique link from registering. So we know we have internet issues and we're happy to have you back and rejoin. Um, yeah, and like I said, please text me or shoot me a message and I'll make sure you can use Zoom as easily as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure if you mentioned the people who are calling in today, if you do star nine, you can raise your hand. That's something you know, I found out from Penny. Pro so that's, tip. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So star nine for anybody who's joining via telephone, uh, we will be engaging um, a little bit more collaboratively today. So uh, yeah, we'll get to that. So let's see lost my spot let's go to the next slide um the wait sorry go back a slide okay let's see there we go so today in part two of our advisory group training we will first discuss convening and uh, meeting planning um, in terms of like meeting or convening advisory groups, uh, planning some of the meetings that will be a part of the entire entirety of, of that standing of the group and 
Also, we will be spending a little bit more of our time on facilitation today um, in terms of like facilitating an advisory group and also talking about some techniques that you will be using or that we can offer today and, uh, and even opening it up to discussion to hear a little bit more about what other people have done because uh, I know there's going to be a few facilitators in the group already. Um, so there's a lot of content today, but we will be having some of those interactive components, like I said, and some of these things include the polls and discussions. Um, I think Janelle mentioned that too, and just helping us stay engaged and uh, being in community together. Uh, we will also have a 10 minute break around 10 a.m. just before we get into the facilitation component, uh, which will be, like I said, the focus of today. All right, and then the next slide. So these are our desired outcomes for today. Overall, um, we will be focusing on the convening, supporting, and facilitation piece. Um, our main outcomes are focusing around uh, understanding and being able to apply steps for convening an advisory committee, understand how to plan advisory committee meetings, understand role of the facilitator for an advisory committee and um, how we'll also like learn and practice um, and add those techniques like I said to you know our toolboxes and um, some of these things will include dealing with difficult behaviors in community meetings and engaging um, the group intentionally so we'll get to that closer to the end um, but yeah, we have a lot to cover, so get ready. And going to the next slide. Uh, we do want to hold space really quickly to do a land acknowledgement. Some of you uh, heard this last time, um, but we wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge um, and take a look at this generalized map of the tribes that originally inhabited the land. And we acknowledge the land on which we sit and which we occupy. The Portland metro area where I'm living and working today rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Waskow, Collitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bansachnook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who have made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. So we take this opportunity to just thank the original caretakers of this land. Um, I did include a little link at the bottom for your future reference to do a little bit more um, research if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the tribes in the area and how you can um, be intentional in that respect in future meetings that you facilitate. All right, next slide. All right, so these are some group agreements today. Like I said, we are gonna be engaging a handful of times. So we just wanna make sure that um, we want to go over the following group agreements. Everybody's on board that no one knows everything. Together we know a lot. We can't be articulate all the time. Embrace curiosity listen to understand, and be present, uh, which can be pretty tricky in working from home. Um, it's easy to get distracted during online meetings. You may feel discomfort. You may have messages or emails coming in. So please do your best to be present so everyone can get the most out of today's training. And this is also why we encourage everyone to leave their cameras on, um, especially when we're doing group activities. So that way we can um, just have that community feeling. Um, and I did wanna quickly ask if anybody has used group ground rules before or group agreements. Um, and if you can use, raise your hand on the Zoom feature um, that Janelle pointed out. Okay, I see a few. Ciara, Maria, Maria Sippen. Oh, hi, Maria. Uh, Alexandra, Zimmerman, Sienna, Jessica. Awesome. 
Um, so just pointing out that group agreements are really important to help set up a group for success because they help you as the facilitator um, to moderate the space. And today we'll be uh, using the agreements that I just listed. All right. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Penny to kick us off on the content for today. Uh, okay, Joey, thanks. Um, since we have a larger audience today, uh, let's do a quick poll and an annotation exercise to get a, just a general idea of who's in the space together today. So um, first off, let's see, next slide please, Janelle, if we can have our first poll up. Uh, are polls showing up for you, Penny? No. Mm. Okay, they're not showing up for me right now. Okay, well, looks like our poll's not working. <laughs> okay, so uh, the way that we can do it is um, I'm going to ask you to just make a note in front of you because we're going to come back to this at the very end of the meeting today. And uh, let's see, remind me of what our poll question was. Do you remember, Janelle? How, let me see. How comfortable do you feel facilitating? Is that right? Yeah, I have it up. Uh, so yeah, the question is, how confident are you in planning and facilitating advisory groups? And we have four options, not confident, confident, somewhat confident, and very confident. Okay, so just make a note of that because we're gonna come back to that at the very end of the session and see if we've moved the needle at all because we're hoping to give you a little bit of confidence uh, today. And so one of the things that we're giving you some confidence in and demonstrating is that when you're doing online meetings, it doesn't matter how well you plan, how much you practice, everything always has the opportunity to go wrong. And so um, we also have the wonderful opportunity as human beings to be flexible. So that was a perfect example of being flexible. <laughs> so with that, let's, uh, let's move on to the, next, uh, to the next slide and hopefully this one will go just a little bit better. So we're very curious about all of you. And so our question is how many years of experience do you have convening and facilitating advisory groups? And while we could ask you to put your answer in the chat, that's just not fun. So we're gonna use this spectrograph and what I'd like you to do is use annotation. So uh, the way we use annotation is uh, scroll your mouse up to the top of your screen and a green bar should appear. And to the, to the right hand side of that green bar, there should be more options. You should have a button that says more options. If you click that, you get a drop down menu. So under more options, drop down menu, then you should see annotate. And when you select annotate, you click on that, then you get a whole another new fun menu bar. So I see people are finding it. And so if you go to stamp in that menu bar, you get the opportunity to put in any of those, uh, any of those marks that people are putting on the screen. So this is a feature in Zoom that's really handy to have when you want some audience participation when you're doing online meetings, because it's hard to get people to engage uh, online, especially with a larger group. So as you can see, we've got a very mixed audience. We've got people with zero to one years, quite a few. We have quite a few with two to three, uh, some with four to five, and quite a few with six plus years of uh, facilitating advisory groups. And uh, I see we've got some people that have check marks way out in the ether. So I think they are facilitators extraordinaire, they must be universal facilitators because their check marks are so far away. But um, anyway, uh, th this is a really good thing to do. And so now I'm going to ask those of you who would to please turn on your camera for a moment. I don't care what your hair looks like. I don't care what your background looks like. I'm just gonna ask um, everybody to take a look at in, in the gallery view and look at all the people that are in the room with you and those of you who mark six plus years of convening and facilitating advisory groups, would you raise your hand visually? Yes, there you go. And if you can't turn your camera on, you can raise your hand virtually going into the participant menu. Because for the rest of you, 
those are the folks in your world that are the experts that you can turn to when you're in a facilitation experience and you're like, gosh, I wish I could talk to somebody that's been doing this. These are the folks that are doing it. So once again, those of you that have six plus years of experience, raise your hand again. Look around, I see Stacy, thank you. I see Rebecca, thank you. Yeah, so there you go. You've got lots and lots and lots of expertise just within your, your own cadre of uh, folks. Okay, all right, that is annotation. Yeah, so, I do have something really quickly to add, Penny. Okay. Um, yeah, I, it's really great to see there's uh, leaders in the room that have experience and also just recognizing that facilitation is an ever-growing experience. It's a journey and just like learning um, is a continuous opportunity in the space. And also as we um, have young leaders coming in and we're having those spaces to teach each other, like um, teaching and, and learning is, is a reciprocal process. So um, definitely encourage the people who are newer to facilitation um, if you're coming across new things that are um, intentional and focusing, you know, equitable practices, then definitely, um, yeah, have that space and encourage other people that have that experience, the years of experience to try something new. Okay, great. So, um, thinking about yourself as a facilitator, we spent a little bit of time on introductions. Um, I'm just trying to get you to think about why do we do that? Why are introductions important when you're facilitating a group? Anybody want to hazard a guess on that? Just go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in if you've got a thought about why is it? Why? Why do we think hard about introductions? Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, it's an opportunity to kind of get a beat on, you know, what people's experiences have been and and to personalize so that you have something to connect with. Yeah, yeah. you can connect with people. Exactly right. It's about, it's about building relationships. It's about personalizing the experience. And when people start to have a relationship with each other, it makes the conversations that you're going to be guiding them through happen a lot more smoothly. Um, how much better can we uh, have conversations with the people we know than with a perfect stranger? So um, introductions are, are very, very important. And it's important to be thoughtful about them. Um, when would you want to change the length of introductions? You can't just throw an introduction out there and it works for every single group. I mean, we had to think about the fact that we could have 40 to 60 people in the room today. And had we gone around and had each one of you introduce you, what's the most typical introduction you've ever seen? Your name, your position, and the, your favorite ice cream, right? And imagine how long it would have taken to have 60 people do that. So we had to be thoughtful about how much time do we have? And also what was important to each other? What would help each other learn a little bit about themselves in a safe way? Okay, so uh, as you can tell, we're going to be um, sort of talking about topics and also demonstrating things as we go. And uh, in the interest of um, making sure that you are getting what you need. Uh, if there's something that you particularly would like us to cover or that you have further questions about, uh, I encourage you to put them in the chat and uh, Janelle will help keep an eye on it and we'll try and address things as we can. Uh, so let me see here. If we move on to the next slide, I think we're going to stop, start talking a bit about convening advisory groups. And one of the things that um, I definitely want to be sure to you think about is as you're thinking about convening advisory groups, you need to be centering equity in all of these processes that we're going to be talking about. And a, a key tool, a way to do that is to be reflect, is to practice reflection in every step of the way, to be really thoughtful, intentional, and be really thinking about equity as you move through all of the steps that we're going to talk to you today about with an advisory group. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, a lot of you were in our training last week where we did talk about convening advisory groups. We talked about uh, how advisory groups can be an asset, how they can help um, improve decisions. Uh, they can help decision makers have a better understanding of the issues that they need to think about as they're making decisions. 
Um, and they can help uh, your decision makers see things from other people's perspectives instead of just the usual people that they hear from all the time. And so an advisory group can help with that, but really only if you have representation on your advisory group or membership in your advisory group that really represents those different uh, opinions and perspectives and lived experiences and so forth. So you can see where that intentionality um, really, really uh, is important as you're thinking about convening. So um, one of the things that you wanna be sure that you think about when you're convening an advisory group is what's the purpose? Why is this group being brought together? What is the driving thing that we need from this group? Because advisory groups are brought together to do what? Provide advice, right? And they're providing advice to somebody. And so you want that advice to be meaningful and useful to the somebody, whoever the convening authority is, whoever the sponsor is, as we like to call it in facilitation. So being sure that you have a clear purpose is really, really important. All right, may I move on to the next slide, please? And I apologize for the acronyms in that last slide. We're, uh, we're, I'm, on a, I'm on a campaign to avoid acronyms, but we didn't do a very good job of it there. Um, so let's talk about recruiting. Um, can be easy, can be hard, can be done a number of different ways. So you wanna keep the group's purpose in mind. Um, and then you wanna think intentionally and strategically. So what kind of skills do you need? But more importantly, what kind of perspectives, what kind of views do you need? What kind of lived experience are you trying to be sure that you're getting included in these discussions about these important issues and whatever the issues are, whether it's transit related issues or uh, I'm working with an advisory group that's giving advice on where to site a solid waste and recycling transfer station. Same thing, doesn't matter what the purpose of the group is, what is it's really important is that you are really thoughtful about who you are reaching out to, who you uh, identify as the, the voices that you definitely want to have on your committee. Um, and uh, representation and, and um, proportionate representation can be important as well. And I don't mean it in terms of well, we need to have 50% of this demographic and 50% of that demographic, although it's always good to be aware of that. But when I'm talking about proportionate, I wanna, you know, I'm thinking about the different kinds of voices. You can think about things such as power dynamics. Who are we inviting to the table? What kind of, what kind of power are they used to having? What kind of power are they going to try to exert? Not even realizing that they do it. So this is where that intentionality really, really comes into play. Um, how many of you, you can use your hand raise, or you can just physically raise your hand, I don't know, or use a, a, an applause button, I don't really care how you do it, but how many of you have um, struggled with populating advisory committees? It's hard to find people that are willing to volunteer to spend their time on an advisory committee. Anybody having that challenge? Yeah, I see a few of you here, Rebecca, yeah, okay. Yeah, Aurora. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's an age when people are not volunteering as much. It's just, it's just a fact of, you know, there's a lot of research been done, but the people are not volunteering as much. They're busy, way busier. People with children, their children are way busier. So that means the parents are way busier keeping the children busy or getting them from their busyness to another busyness. Um, and uh, it's, it's just the way things are. So we have to really think hard about how to uh, fill some of these advisory groups. And sometimes it might take a little bit of, of um, creativity in terms of you might look for other advisory groups that are already existing and say, is there a similar purpose or a, a parallel purpose? Can we combine efforts? Can we work together and expand an advisory group's purpose? An, an advisory group that's already in play, that's already been convened. Can we expand that, expand the membership some? Um, that's one way you could think about it. When you're recruiting for advisory groups, um, you really have to think about this in terms of I'm recruiting. I'm actually out there trying to convince people and help people see why this would be a really important, cool thing to do. And so um, I say you gotta beat the bushes and some of the ways that you can beat the bushes are find groups, find community organizations, find neighborhoods, find anybody that has any of the interests that you're looking for 
and help them understand why this committee is important. Also help them understand how you can help have this group work for them. Uh, when you're trying to be really, really centered and um, really uh, trying to be intentional about your recruitment, you may be looking at people who have never been in an advisory group before. They may even need some, some support to feel like they, they matter, like they can actually contribute something. But those may be the very, very voices that you really, really need to hear from. So you may have to do a little bit of education, a little bit of support work. It may be a little bit different than your standard convening of a committee, but that's how we find some of those voices that we don't typically get uh, on our advisory groups. Because there's the usual cadre of people. I mean, I could go to almost any town USA and look at three advisory committees and guarantee that you're gonna find at least three people that are on all three of them. It's just, there's some people that are born to volunteer and born to do that sort of stuff. But the challenge is, is that you hear from them all the time and they know how to get their voices heard. We want to make sure that we're getting the people whose voices aren't typically heard. And so you have to do some, some very interesting, um, thoughtful work to get out there in the community, find where they are, find where they get their information, find who they listen to, who they talk with, and try and reach in that way. And you know what it always comes back to, really? It's about building relationships. It's about developing relationships with folks so that when you come asking them, we'd really like to have this perspective, this community's perspective on this advisory committee, they know you. They know that you're, what the work is that you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish, and how you're trying to support their community. And then you may have more success with your recruitment. So um, do I think it's always easy? No, it's not. Uh, this committee that I told you that I'm working with, um, the sponsor, I'm very proud of them. They established one of their goals for recruiting a 28 member committee was to have it be 50%, uh, at least 50% um, people of color. And it's quite a challenge because we're in a place in a part of a county that is, does not have a high degree of diversity. So we're working very, very hard to fill uh, seats that way, but it's a wonderful goal to have and it's making us really work hard reaching out talking with a lot of different people to try and find members for the committee. So um, when you set your goals, when you, you know, decide on your membership, that helps drive you to what you need to do for your recruitment. Um, you also want to think about as you're recruiting, you may have the wonderful um, uh, experience of having 250 people volunteer for a group that you only need 12. I've had that as well. And so what you need to do there is you need to have some kind of selection criteria. How are you going to pick from those 250 people? I mean, you're gonna have names, maybe they might've filled out an application if you decided to do a formal application process. You need to be able to look at those criteria in an objective way and, and select the people that represent the interest, the, you know, you can have, you can have geographic, you can have um, demographic, you can have uh, all kinds of criteria, um, you just need to be consistent with those and, and apply those um, objectively. And that's how you can, when you get that many volunteers, that's how you can um, really be thoughtful and intentional about how you're filling those, uh, filling those seats. Okay, all right. So we talked quite, quite a bit about member recruitment. Let's move on, please. Uh, Penny. Yes. We have a couple of comments I just wanted to Oh, thank you. We were able to share. Um, so Jessica was saying, we always have lots of retired folks of certain demographics volunteer, but struggle to find folks of more diverse ages and backgrounds, um, kind of to what you were speaking to. Mm -hmm. Kim Curley also says, recruiting folks of diverse ages and backgrounds maybe can't make a noon weekday meeting because they are working, but changing times to after work or even a weekend could help. Yep, and Christine, Christian tagged on that to tag on to Kim's excellent point, providing childcare and dinner is essential to address barriers. Yes, indeed. And it's also interesting in this time of the pandemic, um, there haven't been very many positives, but one positive that I have seen since we've been operating virtually for about eight months now is that uh, it is a little bit more convenient for people to join advisory groups virtually when they don't have to travel to a meeting, you don't have the issues of 
in my area, I'm in Seattle and, and around, we don't have the issues of traffic, navigating traffic and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we're very thoughtful of as we were, are recruiting our uh, group and setting it up is what barriers do people have to participate virtually? Do they have reliable Wi-Fi? Do they have a laptop or a tablet that they can rely on to participate? Um, what do they need? Are they able to find some quiet space? Um, how can we help them overcome those barriers? And then the other thing, and I'll, I'll talk about it just very briefly, is that uh, we have been working with a county and, and they've actually developed their process. It's taken a bit, but they've developed a process to be able to provide compensation for those who need it to be able to participate on an equal footing. So we have a number of committee members who work for cities or work for organizations, and they're being paid for their time to participate in the advisory committee. Some of the folks that from the, uh, from the um, populations that we're targeting don't have those resources. And so King County has committed to provide compensation so that they can um, be able to participate and not have it be uh, a barrier to participation. So those are some of the other things. And being able to recruit saying that compensation is available for those in need. And, and of course you have to lay out what your require, what your, you know, what your um, sidewalls are with that, but that can help with your recruitment, particularly with those um, folks uh, that are, you're having a hard time reaching. I see Maria said, I missed the first training. So maybe this was already covered. Some experience with advisory group recruitment challenges in the past, climate justice, transportation, adolescent. Community members question the purpose or impact of the group, who the group benefits most, and if their participation actually has power to impact outcomes. How can advisory group facilitators better address this? You know, that's very, very, uh, that's very good. And actually that kind of leads me right into this next slide, which is uh, when we're talking about team building and team structure. Um, most importantly for me, the clear bylaws or charter, that is, to me, they're the rules of the road for how the committee is going to operate. But the really important thing to put in uh, your bylaws or your charter is the purpose of the group, who the group is advising, and what the responsibilities are of the sponsor that is being advised. And so if the sponsor has committed to considering the recommendations of the um, committee and to demonstrate and to report back how they're using their input, that needs to go in the charter, in the bylaws. You need that accountability, not just from the members. Bylaws aren't just about what the members of the committee do. They're also about the responsibilities of the sponsor, of the convening authority. And that addresses some of that. Are we even being listened to? Is what, does what we're saying matter? Um, in terms of what power do groups have, that's another thing that's really, really important to capture in your, your charter or your bylaws is what are, what is the role of the committee? Are they strictly advisory? Do they have any decisions that they will be asked to make? Um, who are they providing their advice to? What are they providing advice on? What is the scope? One of the most frustrating things for committee members and for sponsors, depending on how it plays out, is when a committee gives advice on something that's not within their scope. In other words, it's kind of like your cousin giving advice to you that you didn't ask for. Like the sponsor is going, what, what, did, what am I supposed to do with that advice? I'm not making that kind of decision. I'm not asking this group for input on that decision. This is the scope of what we've asked for their advice on. And so as a facilitator, it's our job to make sure that scope is clearly articulated by the sponsor and that the members know that. And the best way to do that is to put that in the charter and work to make sure everybody understands what's in the charter. Um, so some things that you can put in the, in the charter or the bylaws or the purpose, the tasks, the membership, the roles and responsibilities, the roles and responsibilities of the committee members, of the facilitator, of the sponsor. All of those are really, really important to be uh, included. Your meeting frequency, how, how often is the group going to meet? Set some expectations so people aren't surprised by things. Um, how, do you, how do you expect people to behave? How will this group make decisions? Are they a consensus body? In other words, 
Are they aiming to have all people agree with the advice before they send it on? Are they a voting body? Are they saying we're going to vote up or down and majority rules or supermajority rules? There's different kinds of decisions. They aren't making decisions about the, 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 that are the sponsor's decisions. When we say decision making for the committee, it's about how are they going to decide on what advice they're giving. Those are the decisions that they make. They aren't making the decision that the sponsor is asking them about. So let's, let's give a real example. You have a committee that you convene that is supposed to give funding priorities. So they will give their funding priorities. That committee needs to decide, are they going to do consensus? And that means you're going to work with that committee until they all agree on with what they're saying? Or are you going to have most people agree, but we can do a minority report. And so the minority report says, we three members of the committee, we don't think that advice is good. Here's what we think instead, and that gets included. Um, or is it, we're just going to do a poll and we're gonna give everybody's results. What, what is, how is the group gonna decide on what advice they're going to give so that the decision maker can make the funding choices? It's not that the committee is making the funding choices. So that's where you have to be really clear about purpose, really clear about process, really clear about how you're making decisions. Um, opportunities for ownership. I mean, this is one of the trickiest things about working with an advisory group and working with a sponsor, particularly when you're talking about a government agency sponsor. Um, they, uh, some sponsors are, are um, more, uh, more committed to listening to their advisory groups than others. And that, as a facilitator, that's up to you to explore that and find out what's the commitment there and how much advice are they really, what, what are they really looking for? And are they looking for creativity? Are they looking for, you know, really good, smart thinking and, and maybe people that are looking a little bit outside of the box? Or are they going to frame up, we need input on these three things and we'd like your committee to give us input on these three things. That's, as the facilitator, that's our job to work with the sponsor to understand what they want and what they expect of the committee. And where in that are there opportunities for the committee to own some things? And, and some of the things are their decision process. They, they can own that. Um, how they go about uh, considering issues, what kind of information they would like to get, would they like to hear from some independent experts? Um, those kinds of things. So that they can really feel like they have as much ownership of these issues as the decision makers do, and that they're an important part of the process. Without that, it's hard for them to really feel committed. So be thoughtful about that. Be always thinking about that as you're putting your uh, committee together and um, building your, your structure. Uh, okay, so the last um, piece of convening advisory groups, if I could have the next slide, please would be, um, these are kind of the nuts and bolts of uh, how, how is a committee gonna work? Um, when, are we going to, when are we going to meet? How frequently are we going to meet? What's on the work plan? And a work plan for a committee is, is an important thing because it helps them see how their work and the deliberations that they have, how it fits into the decision-making process that's being gone through by the sponsor. So it's really important to align those things. And again, as a facilitator, you're kind of getting the feeling for me that you're the person in between the two, aren't you? Well, that's kind of the way, that's kind of a big part of your role is that you're working with the sponsoring organization to help be very clear about how this committee is going to work. And so your work plan goes back to the outcomes. What's the purpose of this group? What are the outcomes? Maybe it's an annual process and in January, we do this, and in March, we do this. And in June, there's always gonna be, you know, maybe it's the budget, the you know, preliminary budget numbers are gonna be available for us to look at. And in August, we need to give our advice on this. So it's thinking through the work, um, when does it need to happen, and then setting that work plan up. And what does that do for you? What does that do for you as a facilitator? And what does that do for your committee members? And what does it do for your sponsor? Predictability, um, 
a clear understanding of what's in front of us, what are what the expectations are of us, both the decision maker as to when will I get the input from this committee that I've convened and asked for their advice. Um, the members, when do we need to be thinking about these things? When can I take my vacation? I, I had people that were on advisory committees that needed to know the schedule so that they didn't take vacation when they were supposed to be at a committee meeting. Those are committed members. I, I really appreciated that. Um, and what are the priorities? What, what do you need to get done in each meeting? And this will help you when you get all the way down to drilling down to setting your agendas. So, um, you know, this developing a work plan and schedule is, is pretty critical. Um, let me see, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at some questions. Maria, um, sorry if I mastered the name, Stippen helped facilitate our recent work plan update and it turned out so well. Our committee is so energized about it. Thank you, Jessica. What was it? What was one thing that you really noted that helped really um, energize your committee? Um, sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. <laughs> Nobody ever can. <laughs> uh, so she came in and we had a, a workshop where um, she facilitated just some time for committee members to really share like what, what they felt was the impact they had as committee members and what the things that they were really excited to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, committee members were... Um, talked about like how to make smart goals so you know achievable with a timeline measurable um, and really uh, just kind of identify take all the input from the committee and identify some themes about um, accountability and um, the the impact that they wanted to have and it's a really aspirational uh, work plan, it, it's, it's going to be a lot, but um, it's got things that we can actually knock off the list and structured in a way where different committee members are the champion of different elements of the work plan. So it's not just the chair mm -hmm. is yeah. or me as the staffer that's in charge of everything. Um, so yeah, people are just excited to go lead their, their piece of it. Yeah, and that sounds like uh, she did a really good job of, uh, with the issue of ownership. You know, helping people see, right, what their part is, what their role is, how they, you know, how they really matter and really count. Yeah, very good. Thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay, so uh, those were the four steps for convening. I think the next thing is Joe is going to get us into really talking about planning the meetings now. Now that we've kind of got the big picture and we have our group together and we know what their purpose is, um, Joey, let's move into planning an advisory group meeting. Yeah, thanks, Penny. Uh, great, that was that was a really great conversation. Thank you, everybody, for who um, was participating. Good to hear about all those experiences. Um, so, planning advisory group meetings. Um, let's see. So now that we have our advisory group convening done, uh, thanks Penny for going over all of those things. Uh, it's really important to get that set up to have a successful um, experience with advisory groups. Um, and now that that's set up, we're ready to do the work, we're ready to jump in. So, you know, the first thing is really trying to take an opportunity to review the work plan and schedule, which, you know, is some, preliminary work and that will guide each meeting uh, just to help support and make you make sure that you stay on track. You can also revise the work plan and schedule at, in the future, but it's important to have an idea of what your sessions will look like overall and will help members follow along with the process too. Um, give members opportunity to, to jump in and potentially like um, share different ways to approach topics in the future. Um, but when you start looking at like the meeting to meeting basis, identifying your meeting objectives and desired outcomes is gonna be really important. And these might be outlined in the work plan, they might not be, um, but setting meeting objectives to achieve the desired outcomes 
is important for the group so that it's straightforward. And if you have a work plan lined up, as Penny mentioned, um, so a good, an important question is what will you accomplish for each meeting? Uh, so just making sure that you're, like Penny was saying, being intentional, making sure that there's space for important conversations, um, but also achieving what the group is set out to do and paying close attention to the timeline and trying to achieve that. Um, and then another question is, um, how will you know you accomplish them? And so that's another piece of the objective setting is trying to figure out what connecting the desired outcomes to actual actionable items. And if you achieve them, what is the goal? Like you can set goals for yourself. And that's an important part of the meeting setting as well. And even though it's um, the convening part, I think is definitely a huge um, setup piece, but the meeting planning is more logistical and, and there's a lot more, I think, opportunity to be creative and flexible and have space where you can encourage members to participate in, in different ways. Um, do you have anything to add there, Penny? No, I think you covered it. Thanks, Joey. Okay. Awesome. And then going into the next slide. And the next piece is meeting format. And once you identify your objectives, your goals, and the meeting topics, it's important to figure out how your meeting format will help or what is the best meeting format to help achieve those things? So this is like another layer to having a successful space um, that supports the needs of participants and the public. And focusing on the intentionality as well, like we wanna have opportunities where people can come to the space, be present, be themselves and enjoy the space um, and also have the opportunity to participate and have their voices heard in ways that normally aren't potentially. So yeah, kind of going back to that piece of, um, you know, understanding like what is, what you're really trying to get out from the meeting. And I have a couple of examples. Um, one is like a virtual space. Uh, so like Zoom sessions, this is an important meeting format um, as we all come to, to learn in safety, public health crises, like this is, this is an important um, tool to use that gives access to people that normally wouldn't be available. But you also have to think on the other side of things where there's in-person meetings are easier for historically underserved communities that don't necessarily have access or disproportionately have less access to internet. And so that's another piece that we have to keep in mind. And so how can we best create a space that will inform um, the most intentional space for, for the people? And let's see. Um, and kind of like emphasizing the accessibility piece, making sure that there's options available. You need to understand what barriers for participation look like for these group members. Uh, and this could include visual, auditory, and language barriers. Uh, so you definitely have to do some homework and relationship building to truly understand uh, what the different needs are across the base. And of course you can ask making sure that they have opportunities from the get-go, um, but there are some people who will, you'll need to create space for to share those things. And this is where we ask what kind of accessibility um, needs people have and, you know, just making sure that opportunity is open. And, to figure that out and, and are necessary and are we making them available? So just kind of like that cyclical process of 
you know, just checking in with people every now and then and just making sure that it's, it's an opportunity for growth and, and um, accessibility or like just space for people to be fully engaged in. Another element to this is the public meetings law that we mentioned last time. And this space is, or the public meetings law is an important part that talks about accessibility more strictly and like um, making sure that there's ADA accessible um, spaces that if you have like an in-person meeting, um, for example, um, but also making sure that your materials, like if you have digital meetings like we're in now, making sure that people have PDF, um, like ADA accessible PDF documents and making sure people get printed materials ahead of time if they need them, um, things like that. So just making sure that you're being aware of, of those things and also not, um, not, not necessarily, um, or you just have to be aware of like where you're coming into the space and if you're going to, um, oh, I can't think of the word, I'm just gonna move on. <laughs> so that's pretty much the main piece of this, but um, some resources and materials, like I said, you need to uh, look at the meetings law or the public meetings law um, and think of some of the pieces that are a part of the meeting, like the presenters that are gonna be there, presentations, printed packets for accessibility, um, like I was saying, and um, also like determining too, if, if you need a train facilitator, um, that the meeting format and the topics might require a third party um, or an additional support. Um, and this is an important question that you might have to just kind of um, think ahead of time, figure out when and why a third party facilitator would be necessary for your reasoning. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much this slide. It was kind of all over the place. <laughs> Penny, do you have anything to add to that slide? No, I, I think we're fine. I think we'll talk about uh, a little bit more about facilitators and neutrality a little further on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then our last slide before we take a break, um, we are going to go over just some general things to consider or some other things to consider when you're planning meetings. Uh, the first one is providing members needed materials, like I said, um, and identifying the information that needs to be provided to the committee. So thinking of um, readings or information that will help the committee have a clear understanding of why they're coming into the space and how they can participate fully. And so just trying to think ahead of time, like what documents do people need? What, um, what materials are going to be important to help them make some of these decisions in the space? Um, and then another piece is providing just being aware of like when you're providing space and time for public comment. And we talked a little bit about this last time. Um, this can be outlined in the charter or the bylaws, uh, but this can also be decided upon for each meeting as we heard last time. And uh, there's a few people who mentioned that they like to switch it up and so have public comment in the beginning or the end. Um, some people just have it consistently at the end um, for example, but just kind of making sure that you're creating that space and limiting the time. Uh, like Penny mentioned last time, you need to um, be aware of how many people are coming in and, and you don't want it to take up like three hours of the meeting. So you, that's why it's important to set a time frame for that space, but just being aware of where that fits in. Um, and then the last piece is evaluation. So making sure that you develop evaluation method and questions. And this will help you improve the way you run meetings and to understand if something isn't working for participants. Um, so yeah, just asking if the meeting worked, um, do you want to keep doing it the same way? Um, how will you know? And this 
is the only way you're going to find out is if you ask people. And evaluation can be as simple as a poll like we did earlier um, that didn't necessarily work, but, you know, we're keeping track of that. Um, also, you know, you can do thumbs ups and thumbs down in the Zoom call to kind of gauge that. Um, or you could do like a survey monkey and get like really in the, in the details about it if you really want to understand what are some opportunities to um, improve. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the evaluation piece is just creating space for you to reflect and to improve your processes each time and ma making sure you really listen to the members and the, the community members that are involved in the process. Thanks, Joey. Hey, before we go to break, we do have a couple more things in the chat. Um, okay. Christian has a great suggestion. He said, in this time of online meetings and potential tech issues, it's important to have a plan B should Zoom explode and lock the folks out. For instance, um, have a backup non-Zoom conference call number. He said, this recently mm -hmm. happened in a meeting which required a, quor a quorum, lots and lots of work for staff to reschedule. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, yeah, I never thought of that. Somebody said that they'd never thought of that. I had never had either having a backup conference call. We kind of forget about the archaic old conference calls, but they still work fine. You know, we're so accustomed to Zoom and Adobe Connect and go to meeting and go to webinar on all these other platforms and teams and so forth that we forget about the old tried and true conference calls. Then um, Maria uh, provided her summary of the OBPAC experience. She said, after working with youth advisory boards for years in public health and also recently learning from participatory budget Oregon, participatory budgeting Oregon methodology, making time for play and games, personalizing activities and investing time in the agenda to bring out everyone's individuality really helps strengthen the group dynamic. Adults mm -hmm. like fun as much as youth. Paying attention to adult learning principles and adult learning needs helps create a braver space. My own disabilities, varying abilities help me adjust in these spaces as facilitator or participant. Excellent, excellent uh, comments, Maria. Thank you so much. And it is indeed true, and it's why we try to work in things like polls and, and um, small group discussions and things like that. It's so important, and particularly in this day and age right now of, of virtual engagement, to try and find ways, even through the virtual space, to bring people together and and, and help, them, um, help them laugh, help them have fun together. Uh, I think that's all we have for comments. Oh, no, we've got another one. Um, regarding public comment, we've been struggling how to address the random comments we receive at some meetings. How do we address the concerns that people bring to the committee and help people feel heard without hijacking our meeting agenda? Really good question, Jessica. Um, Linda notes that public comments are not necessary during a public meeting according to the public meeting laws, and that's, that's right. They are not required. Uh, many um, organizations think that they are a necessary, not legally required, but a necessary part of meetings. And one of the ways to keep um, comment periods from being hijacked is for committee, for committee meetings, one of the things that I always do as the facilitator is I announce the public comment period. Um, we have, uh, if if we are in person, we have a sign up. And if we're not in person, then we ask people to put their names in the chat or to raise their hands or use whatever is available in your meeting platform. And then um, I, depending on how many people have asked to make comment, I put a time limit out there. I also note and make it very clear in every meeting, I have the same script. Um, this is our time for public comment. We have X number of people signed up. So each person will get 90 seconds, I'll be timing them. This is an opportunity for you to make comments to the committee. You will not get a response from the committee, but the committee will, uh, the committee members will, are listening and will take what you say into consideration. And we can ask people um, to try and keep their comments salient to the work that the committee is doing, but I typically don't do that because people are gonna say what they're going to say. They're going to comment what they're going to comment. We, um, I always manage the expectation that this is not an opportunity for people to ask questions of the sponsoring agency, that this is an opportunity for them to provide their comments to the committee as the committee is doing its work. 
And so in that way, it, it reduces the need for a response to some of those random, you know, way off the mark comments. They're just a comment and the committee does with it what the committee wants. We don't typically establish a committee process for responding to comments. Although I will tell you, if you want to see a committee that is doing that, I'm working with one right now with ODOT uh, in, um, uh, for the I-5 and I-205 tolling project. We have a, a committee uh, underway, the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee, and we have established a process for comments to the committee. People can make comments to the committee either in the, in the meetings or via email. We provide all those comments to the committee and then um, we provide them two days before the meeting and then we ask the committee if there are any of the comments that they would like to have a conversation about at the next meeting. So we actually have kind of sort of formalized uh, and made the opportunity, made the space for committee members to say, oh, I heard this from a comment and I think it's important that we talk about it. So it's not the sponsor, it's not the facilitator saying what they should talk about, it's the committee members. So there again, there's that, there's that ownership piece. So if you wanna look at, you know, look at the EMAC, the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee, all of their stuff is online and you can see um, their agendas and, and all of their materials that they're using to support that. Um, okay, all right, somebody would like my script for public comment. Uh, I will, um, I will, uh, I'm sure I have it written somewhere. I will get that to you in one way or another. Janelle, can you make a note of that please so I don't forget? And uh, go along for break, Joey. Yeah, we'll jump in for 10 minutes, get up and stretch, use the restroom if you need to, and feel free to turn off your cameras and stay muted during this time. Thanks everyone, be back in 10 minutes. 10, 15, thanks.
Well, <clears throat> well, excuse me. <clears throat> I think I have 10.15. Is that what time we were supposed to reconvene, Joey? Okay. Um, yes. Um, okay, so well, let's see. Back from break. If uh, Janelle, if you're back, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so we're going to talk now about the actual facilitation. Um, how do we as facilitators do our work once we have this group enthralled, captivated, captive, whatever we've done with this poor group of people because we're now the facilitator. So um, one of the things that I wanna start with and I wanna um, be sure and uh, reiterate and have you think about it all the time is that effective facilitation, you're centering equity and you're building trusting relationships with both the sponsor, the agency or the organization that has asked for you to help with this advisory committee and with the people that you're working with in the committee. Um, and you may be working with different kinds of folks, different uh, people from different uh, walks of life. Um, you may be partnering with all kinds of different people. So here's an opportunity, let's find a little bit more. Um, and tell me what types of communities the people you are partnering with or working with or getting advice from, what kinds of communities are you representing and partnering? Could it be, it could be rural, could be tribes, could be students, could be seniors. And we're gonna use annotation again. So you're gonna go up to the top of your screen and find view options. And then, and then no, can we back up one slide please? Yeah, leave it there. Um, view options, find your annotation button, then get your annotation menu. And this time you're going to use the text option. So there should be a little T for text. And you'll find miraculously that if you just put your cursor over the screen, when you've hit that text, you can start typing things in. So somebody demonstrate how facile they are with annotation and type in what kind of communities uh, are the people that you're partnering with or working with or facilitating? What kind of communities do they represent? People having trouble with annotation? I'm not sure if the annotation um, option is um, available. Uh-oh, Janelle, did we turn off annotation? Oh, you're right, I did. I turned it off so that we didn't have stars everywhere, but I will turn it back on. It should be good to go now. All right, everybody, try, sorry about that. Try that again, view options and down to annotate. There it is, thank you. I just thought I didn't have it. Thanks and for elevating that all. T for text. Okay, so I see a B, somebody's got it. So when you click, you just get a little text box and the kind of communities that you're representing, I can say I was representing transfer stations. I should say transportation users, but I can't edit it, so. Highly rural, frontier, low income, transit deserts, suburban businesses, housing, rural, transportation, rural, aha. Uh -huh. Bicycle, pedestrian, renters, transportation options, black, indigenous, and additional people of color, people who walk and bike, People, what we got one over the top of another one. Um, rural, rail, a lot of rural, childcare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's important about this? Why do we care? There are all of these different communities that you're partnering with, talking with, representing. It matters. People come to us with very different positions, very different thought processes, very different lived experiences and lived realities, right? Thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna teach Janelle something. As the host, um, you should be able to save this screen if you want to, you just save it. And then you also should have a clear all only the host has that. Yep, see, look at that. How miraculous is that? And then, oh, look at that. Somebody's still, somebody's still typing. And then in that same menu, Janelle, you should also have the option to stop annotating. 
I don't think you have to go into the settings and turn it off. Okay, so she just disabled us. We can no longer play. Huh. Gee, thanks, Janelle. She's so powerful. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, please. Anybody thinking about how they can have fun with annotation at their next meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay, I saw that. I saw that smile, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's talk about um, let's talk about the basics of facilitating an advisory group. So probably the most important thing for us to think about and, and, is, and I think about as I go into facilitation is what's our role? <laughs> okay, you ready? Here's your role. You're the timekeeper, topic tracker, troubleshooter, interventionist, progress mind, process minder, strategist, counselor, um, coach, uh, let's see what else. Um, creative thinker, uh, uh, let's see what else. Um, conflict negotiator. Um, you have a lot of roles that you might possibly play as a facilitator. And I always say that if you consider yourself a good multitasker, you can be a great facilitator. Because I think of facilitation when I'm actually in a meeting facilitating, it is about watching a number of different things and keeping different things in your head at one time. Um, keep an eye on time because we want to demonstrate respect for, to people for their time. I always, it's just something that I do. I always, when I introduce myself to a new group or, or to a public meeting or whatever I'm facilitating, I always introduce myself as a facilitator and tell them what that means, what I'll be doing. And I almost always end with, and that means that I really committed to starting us on time and getting us out on time out of respect for your time. And people really appreciate that. We are the topic tracker. We are troubleshooters. Things happen. Holds don't work. Zoom explodes. Um, flip charts fall down. Room temperatures are too high. Uh, what else happens? All kinds of things happen. People are lost. People didn't get the packets. People didn't get the information ahead of time. The speaker is late. The speaker is early and has to leave early. All kinds of things happen and we're just Johnny on the spot figuring out how to deal with it. So we're chief troubleshooters. Um, I, to me, that's the fun part of facilitation because I love to solve problems. And so, if, and the best way to think about that is just try and anticipate what could possibly go wrong and be ready for it. Um, we're interventionists. Sometimes, believe it or not, group members don't always fall in line with their behavior the way we would like them to or the way we would like them to behave with other members in the group. Sometimes you have dominators, sometimes you'll have interrupters, sometimes you'll have people who are completely checked out. Sometimes you'll have people who are asking you about things that you talked about an hour ago, but they weren't paying attention because they were on their cell phone. Um, your job is, your role is to be the interventionist. Sometimes you intervene in the moment, sometimes you intervene on break, sometimes it's a blanket intervention to the group after the meeting. Um, but those are the kinds of things that we do. We, we try and figure out what are the problems, what do we need to you know, correct in terms of behaviors and things, and how can we do that? We're the process minder. Are we being fair and equitable? Are we calling on people equitably? Are we giving people the same amount of space and access to the space? Are we providing space for things to unfold, for people to think? Are we making sure that we're not asking people to share their opinions before they've gotten all the information. Do we have the process straight? Um, and we're strategists. How can we, so here's our, here's our stated objective. How can we get our committee from here to that stated objective? That's an important part of what we do. That's our strategy. That's, we exercise that when we're planning our agenda, when we're figuring out what kinds of tools and tactics to use, when we're figuring out how much discussion time do we need, how much information needs to be shared, what do people need to know before we can ask them to move on. All of those things are part of our responsibilities. Another responsibility that we have, and this is a tricky one because many of you work for agencies and also facilitate groups. And so when I talk about neutrality, it's probably a little challenging for you because it's like, how can I be neutral if I work for the agency that is sponsoring this committee, right? So when I talk about neutrality, what I mean is that we are content neutral. And so 
we have a group, let's just, let's just use my transfer station siting group. We have a group that is helping a, an organization determine where to site a new recycling and, and solid waste transfer station. Um, I know a lot about solid waste, happens to be in my background, but I don't care as the facilitator what the committee says about where that transfer station gets cited. I have no stake in that outcome. I have no stake in that content about the transfer station. My only care and my responsibility in being neutral is that I make sure that information is presented objectively to the committee and that the committee has a good objective process that comes up with an outcome. To me, what the outcome is, do they like site A, site B, site Z? doesn't matter at all. What matters to me as a facilitator is that they had a good, defensible, equitable process that got them to their recommendations. That's what I mean when I talk about neutrality. And so it's possible for you to be employed by the organization that sponsors the committee and still be a process neutral, uh, uh, excuse me, a content neutral facilitator. Because as facilitators, our main job is the process. It's not the outcome, it's the process. We're not trying to drive a committee anywhere. And if we are, then we shouldn't be facilitating. And if your sponsoring organization is telling you, I want you to deliver this committee and I want this committee to say this, that, or the other, you have a problem and you need to have a long, hard conversation with your sponsor. So again, we're content neutral. We have no stake in what the outcome is. Rather, did the group get to an outcome and was it an equitable, fair, um, predictable, and uh, defensible process? Because really, can any of us be truly neutral? We all have our biases. We all have our, our things that we've experienced in life that cause us to feel one way or another. We all have biases. So it. it you know, there's a lot of discussion about can facilitators really be neutral. So I make it very clear that in, in my practice and what I think of as the kind of facilitation that we're talking about, we're content neutral. Does that make sense, everybody? I'm looking over in chat and I'm seeing 18 chat messages. Um, Jessica says, I'm not sure if it's harder for me when my committee asks for staff opinion or when they don't. So one of the things about, that's a good, that's a good comment. Um, if you're asked to facilitate a committee, you should not also be, you should be the facilitator for that committee. You should not be the content expert. You should be asking other people from your organization to come in and present the content and talk about the content. You're there to facilitate the committee to help with the process. You try to straddle both worlds, it's going to be challenging because you're going to run into situations exactly like that. So to the best that you can, bring in others from your organization to pr provide the content, to provide the context, and you focus on the process and focus on helping move the group through the conversations to get to whatever your objective is. Okay. Um, we just put meeting tools up here and um, I wanna spend just a little bit of time talking about some meeting tools. Um, you can, I honestly, you can read uh, just Google facilitation and advisory groups and you'll find lots and lots of information about all of these tools. But I do wanna just mention them because they are important ones. We already talked about the charter. Um, that you know, This is where you are documenting and recording the purpose, the sponsor, the outcomes, the expectations, the decision processes, all of those things. You don't have any authority as a facilitator. Your only authority as a facilitator is that you and the committee and the sponsor have all agreed to work to what's in this charter. So you need that charter. That's what you go back to. When things aren't going well, you go back to the charter. When the group seems to be getting off track and over time you're noticing that it's kind of unfocused and so forth, you bring it back to the charter. When you've got a few people dominating and it seems like, wow, as I observe this over time, it seems like half of our committee is kind of checked out and they're not really talking about things, you go back to the charter and back to your ground rules and things like that. That's why a charter is your number one most important tool. And a lot of sponsors say, yeah, we, this is a small committee. We don't really need a charter. 
Charter doesn't have to be a big, long, giant document. I've done a one-page charter, but it still captures those key elements because that's my tool to work with the committee and with the sponsor as I move forward. Um, you you want to have your norms for working together. What's your structure? Do you have enough? Don't have too much. Your agenda is a really important tool. Boy, how many of you have ever gone into a meeting that was called and then there's no agenda? And then you watch people flail. Not a committee meeting necessarily. It could be just a meeting at work, right? Or even a volunteer group or something. A meeting without an agenda is like a is like a, a driverless car without a destination, right? It's just headed for trouble. Um, how do you know if you're off track if you don't know what your track is? <laughs> so agenda is an important tool. Um, it can help provide order. It, it can also, you know, it can also, you can build it so that there's flexibility in it. And so agendas are important. Note taking, how are you gonna record what people are saying? What's the agreement between you and the group and the sponsor? Does the sponsor need a very um, detailed um, agenda that identifies who said what? Or do they just want a very high level summary of a presentation was made and here are the here's a discussion, here are the action items that also should be agreed upon beforehand. Um, are you gonna be using flip charts or virtual flip chart, virtual whiteboards, things like that? Um, they're very useful tools, particularly any way that you can show folks in person, a flip chart is wonderful for this, online um, doing an annotation uh, of a screen is the facilitator doing an annotation on a screen can be very useful in demonstrating to people that you are hearing what they're saying. When you're writing up, oh, so-and-so suggested this, and you don't even put who the so-and-so is, but you just suggest this, or somebody suggested this, when you put it in writing, whether virtually or on paper that people can see, it triggers something that like, oh yes, those are my words. That's really important they're listening to me. And that really helps build that trust and build that, you know, that trusting relationship between you and the members and the sponsor. Um, the other tools are information. What kind of information are you gonna to provide to people and how are you going to provide it and when are you going to provide it? How many of you have ever had a stack of handouts and then stood there and thought, hmm, in person, should I hand them out before the meeting? Should I hand them out during the meeting or should it be a takeaway after the meeting? It's not an idle question. It's one that you really need to think about because handouts can be very distracting. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I am the read ahead person. If you give me a handout and say, now don't turn to page two, I'm gonna be on page five by the time you finish saying don't turn to page two, right? Um, if you're on, you give me a packet of items and one for each agenda item, I'm gonna be at the last agenda item before you've even finished with the first one. I'm just the read ahead kind of person. Um, that can be distracting in a meeting, right? What about the person that, um, that says, gosh, I, I, you know, I'm a visual learner and you've given me all these words. I don't have a clue what this is all about. You, know, you really need to think about how you're going to present information and, and make it useful for your group members and not distracting. So those are some of the tools that we like to talk about. Uh, let's get going on to the next slide, please. Those were our basics. Um, how about some techniques for your, for your toolbox? Let, let's talk about uh, some other stuff. Two things that we really wanna talk a bit about are um, centering intentional participation, centering equity and, and, and um, respect. So when we talk about centering intentional participation, that means you're putting an equity lens on to ensure that everyone is heard, especially the folks um, from historically or currently underrepresented or underserved communities. Uh, and yes, I'm talking about people of color, women, people with disabilities, um, so forth and so on. And uh, there are some different ways for you to be really thoughtful. First off, the one that I said earlier is to be really thoughtful and aware all the time of who's in the room, who's talking, who's not talking, who's being talked over, who's being talked at. Um, all of those things. Remember, as a facilitator, our, heads, our, our head is on a kind of a 
kind of a spring. We're bunging back and forth, looking around the room, looking at people. It's why we ask you to put your cameras on when we're facilitating meetings in person. I mean, uh, virtually, because when I can't see you, it takes away one of my most important tools as a facilitator is the expression on your face, your body language, all of that. I'm watching all of that. And when I'm being very intentional about participation, I'm watching really, really carefully for the people who don't usually get involved, who to traditionally get overlooked, run over, and looking for opportunities to make sure they can be heard. Sometimes it's uh, one tool that I use is a round robin. Um, when, when I notice that I have some people who don't speak up, I'll do a round robin, which is you know go around the room and ask each person to respond to something. But the one thing that I always do about that is I let people know that I'm going to do that ahead of time. And why do I do that? Anybody have a thought about that? Go ahead, just unmute and jump in. Why would I let people know ahead of time that I'm going to do a round robin? Rebecca. Because for those who don't really like to speak in public, they at least they know that they're, that's going to be expected of them and be prepared to speak up. Right, exactly. And maybe give them some time to think about what they're going to say so that they're not suddenly just called on. And it's like, oh, I didn't know you were going to call on me. Right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's really important that you don't surprise people, that you give them some warning about what you're going to do, but that you also open that space up and give them opportunity. Um, a little later on, Joey's going to talk to you a little bit about people who... Um, perhaps stand in the way of that, some of our dominators and, and, and other people who um, might not actually, you know, might actually inhibit some of that. Not intentionally, but just by the way that they behave. So, you know, how do you manage some of those? So, yeah, that's, it's, it's really, really important for us to be very, very intentional about that and be very watchful, um, build in mechanisms for people to uh, be able to participate. And, and it may take, if you've noticed that you have someone on the committee who's silent a lot, this is you know one of those interventions again, you may wanna talk with them at break or after the meeting or in between meetings and give them a call and explore that with them. Is it comfortable for them? Do they, is there something that's stopping them from feeling like they can participate? You know, find out what's going on and find out how you can make that space comfortable for them. The other piece that's, that's really, really important for your toolbox is that respect piece, um, respecting all values and voices. And, and remembering that we all have our own lived experience and everybody's bringing that into the room. And, and some people, they may have gotten the courage to come to the meeting, but they, they are not accustomed to being listened to, so they don't offer their opinions. They may do fine in email or writing things down, but they don't, they don't speak up. Um, as we strive for equitable processes, these two things, centering intentional participation and respecting all values and voices are really, really important. And so one of the things that really contributes to that for us is to understand position, positionality. Now I'm gonna make a stab at, at talking about positionality and then I'm gonna ask Joey to, to jump in and, and add to anything that I've missed. Um, but so what is positionality? You can uh, go on to the next slide. For those of you that are visual, um, positionality, it's the, it's the context, the, the social and political context that creates our very own identity. And, and this is our context in terms of our race, our class, our gender, our sexuality, our ability status. Um, positionality says, you know, how we identify influences and potentially biases within ourselves in our understanding and outlook on the world. I grew up in um, rural New Hampshire in the 50s and 60s, and I'm dating myself, but there you go. Um, and let me tell you, I grew up in a very, very, very white-centric uh, uh, background. Um, in fact, I, it wasn't until my senior year of high school that we had a person of color move into our uh, uh, town and attend our high school. And I, I don't remember anything specific, but I remember, remember noting that, holy smokes, you know, look at that person. So that's my experience. 
And, and I carry that with me here 60, 50 years later, right? So it contributes to my understanding of an outlook on the world. So look at that, look at that graphic there. Um, in addition to the things that I said, race, class, gender, um, other things, income, your immigration status, your, your heritage, your history, your language, your education, all of those things contribute to your positionality who you are and how you are, what your, how your identities um, help you or make you move through the world, how you are as you move through the world. Understanding your positionalities, um, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff to start thinking about it and, and name all of these things and understand that that's what goes into who you are. And then it also helps us understand how we can help others. This is one of the most important skills that you can practice. Um, while you're thinking about facilitation. It's, it's equally as important as, as, as your convening steps, your planning steps, and your actual facilitation. Positionality will help you with that intentional participation. Um, it will help you recognize when um, somebody isn't participating and what might be going on. Um, it'll help you recognize how you're responding when you may have to do an intervention. So because it's important, we want you to really think about this and to do a reflection activity. Can I have the next slide, please? We want you to practice being aware of your own positionality. So we have a scenario for you and an exercise. And this is individual. We're not going to put you into groups. We want you to do this on your own. Can I have the next slide, please? So here's what we're going to do. We have this little scenario. Um, so the scenario is you've been asked to facilitate a committee meeting in Baker City. Does everybody know where Baker City is? Anybody here from Baker City? If you are, speak up. Tell me you're from Baker City. Anybody? Okay, all right. We didn't know if we'd have anybody from Baker City or not. Okay, so here, here it is. You're facilitating, you've been asked to facilitate a committee meeting in Baker City. The topic is about adding public transit access in the outlying areas of Baker City. Um, the committee that you're going to be facilitating is mostly middle-aged to elderly males. There's one middle-aged female. They're all fluent English speakers except for one whose primary language is Mandarin Chinese. Okay, so you've got the scenario? You got that. That's your assignment, your facilitation assignment. So what I'd like you to do is to take five minutes now, and this is individual, and down at the bottom of the slide, you'll see two questions. So thinking about positionality and considering your own identity and what makes up your own identity, put yourself in that position where you're being asked to facilitate this committee meeting, how would you personally feel going into that experience as a facilitator? What might you be feeling? And then switch roles and put yourself in as, a, as if you were a participant in that committee with your identities. And think about both of those things and, and try and jot down how would you personally feel? Because this is how we start to think about our positionality is how does our positionality cause us to feel about the situation we're in? Okay, so I've got 1043. Take five minutes to uh, ponder on both of these questions. How would you feel if you were the facilitator? And how would you personally feel as a participant? And we will check back in at 1048. And feel free to turn off your camera if you want to while you're thinking about this and cogitating on this. And then and then, just to give you warning, I'm going to call on a few people and ask you just to share a thought.
All right. So um, hopefully you all had a little bit of time and, and came up with some thoughts about how you would feel as a facilitator based on your identity. And so uh, I know I threatened to call on people, but I'm going to give you a chance to raise your hands first. If you'd like to share something briefly, raise your hand. And... Oh, it's got an echo. Okay, Tamara, why don't you share with us, please? Well, one of the things that I looked at it and it's like, okay, we're not even, we're not balanced into the population of um, most areas um, as far as being equal. And the, uh, also a question, you know, making sure that I have the correct, uh, a correct grouping of people that will actually use the transit. And how, and so how, uh, my question is, is if you went in as a facilitator, how would you feel as a, I'm, I'm, I'm making assumptions now, but I'm looking at you on the camera and I, I think I see a, a, a white woman. How would you feel as a white woman going into that group and facilitating that group? I was not fairly represented. Anyone else want to share? Thank you so much. Anyone else want to share how they would feel or how they would feel as a, or as a participant? And of course, don't forget your hand raising thing is uh, in your participants uh, menu is where you can raise your hand virtually for those of you who don't have your camera on. I'm not, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just looking for you. Um, I thought I saw, yeah, Linda. Don't forget to unmute. Unmute, okay. <laughs> uh, as a facilitator, I would already be aware that this person has been asked to be on the committee. So I would want to meet with them to find out what their needs were. And uh, then uh, I thought of, I'd be concerned that they uh, couldn't understand what half of what was being said. So I would ask if they needed a, a um, interpreter and uh, if they wanted a headset I'd make sure that they had their agenda packets in the language that they understood mm -hmm. um, that would uh, to so to accommodate them so they could come to the meeting and be prepared I'd also love to be able to meet with them to go over the agenda packet prior to the meeting um, so to go, thank, to go thank you thank you Linda uh, Okay. I think, I think um, I, I want you to all think just a little bit. I think some of you kind of missed the point here. I'm not asking you to um, assess what's wrong with this committee or anything like that. I'm asking you as you, from your own identity, your own personality, and your own person, and your lived experiences, how would you feel walking into that group to facilitate them? That's what I'm trying to get you to think about. That's that self-reflection. It's, it's, always, it's always tempting to say, well, I, I can see what's wrong with this committee, but sometimes we get committees that aren't perfect and we're asked to facilitate them. And so it's really important that we're aware from our own identity, how would we respond in that case? Um, Sienna, you went up and then you went back down. Did you have something you wanted to share? Can't hear you. Still can't hear you. I'm going to flip over to Sierra and then I'll come back to you, Sienna. Sierra. Um, I was just thinking that I would feel a little bit um, intimidated in the fact that um, I might not be trusted as much coming into a new community and being a woman and being younger than them and maybe coming from a bigger city. Um, they might not trust my um, my abilities to lead or that I don't understand them, understand their community. Um, so yeah, those are my initial thoughts looking at the, the prompt. Yeah, and that's exactly, thank you so much for sharing that. That's exactly what we're looking at is in, for us to be aware in ourselves, in and of ourselves, how we might feel and, and feeling those things there might make you facilitate in a different way than you would with a different group, right? And that's all because of how you feel walking into that room. So that's what we're trying to get at here with this, with this reflection activity is before you walk into a room to facilitate them, 
be aware of yourself and the kinds of things that cause you to be who you are and how you are and how that might how you might respond to a situation during the facilitation um during the facilitation uh okay so it's you know positionality is 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 uh, tough stuff and it's something that i encourage you to think about and reflect on more i'm i know i'm working on it i have uh if can i go back two slides please to now really quickly yeah when we go to this graphic when i think about and answer all of these questions for myself i realize that i have a very 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 strong a sense of identity based on all of those things. And it colors how I move through space and how I work with groups. And I need to be aware of that when I'm working with groups who don't have the exact same identities that I have, right? So that's, uh, that's where we were trying to get to with, with that. Thanks, Janelle, for uh, going backwards for me. Uh, now let's go forward a few because uh, we time is ticking and we've got so much to share. It's so hard to do all of this in only three hours. I'd like to have you for a week um, because it's a great group and there's just so much that we'd like to share, but we don't have that much time. So um, we're uh, going to move on to some more uh, techniques um, for your toolbox. And some of them are going to hit very lightly. Some of them we'll spend a little bit more time with. But these are the, these are the techniques that we're, we're going to hit on. And um, when you look at that graphic again, here's, you know, those facilitation skills. I said, what's your role? Well, these are the things you're doing. You're observing, you're listening, you're questioning, you're attending. That means you're paying attention, you're watching. Think about all of those things as we quick, quick, quick go over some, uh, some tools. So I'm going to hand it over to Joey, who's going to take on the first couple, flow management, I think. Thank you, Penny. Um, the next slide we talk about flow management and keeping discussions focused. Um, and I won't spend too much time here because we touched base on this a few times earlier, but um, focusing on the flow of how the meetings are going as a facilitator and then also focusing on um, the way things are, are making it um, focus on the desired outcomes and the objectives and just kind of keeping that bigger picture thinking of what the space is like and how it's functioning and if it's doing what needs to be done to achieve what you're set out to do in that, that meeting. Um, so we talked a little bit about pre-planning um, and this could help flow and like focus, just making sure that there's like good transitions between the different topics. Um, like somebody mentioned earlier, having like a plan B, you just never know what's gonna happen, especially um, in, in the digital world now. So um, making sure that you have that, like a con contingency plan. Um, somebody mentioned having a backup dial in conference number if Zoom isn't working for people, uh, that was pretty good idea. Um, you also want to make sure that you have the right materials and you also want to make sure that um, you're aware of like what types of spots in the information might create some disruption, I guess, to the flow, um, potentially depending on who's in the group and tying that back to positionality and like understanding the, the makeup of the, the group. Um, but some things that you might want to just keep an eye on are some questions of, how are things moving and, and using the agenda as a tool, like Penny mentioned, that's a really great um, tool to, to kind of just make sure that things are moving forward and timekeeping and um, also just, you know, having an idea of if the presentation is going too long. So just making sure you're in the habit of asking those questions and checking in with yourself and, and even like the team and, and your members um, are, people engaged um, back to what Penny was saying, like you wanna make sure that you're keeping an eye out for who's being involved and who's speaking up and um, trying to act in the moment. If, if you, like Penny suggested doing the round robin, if people aren't speaking up and creating different ways for people to share, um, if they feel like they can't um, get a word in, if, if there are specific people just talking too much, which we'll get to in a second, um, some disruptors. We 
can have a set of tools that can um, just help improve that flow, right? Um, you also want to keep attention to comprehension, making sure that people are absorbing the information. Um, and you can do like little check-ins here and there, making sure there's space for questions. Um, and then you also want to make sure that, like I said earlier, that the flow is focused and giving you uh, what you need to achieve your objectives for the meeting. Um, and focusing a little bit on, on that piece, it's asking questions like if people are getting too in the weeds, um, are there people who are getting off topic and how, how can you bring that back? And um, it might be a little bit of a mixture of tools that we'll go into in the next few slides that Penny will talk about, um, but it could be like rephrasing or like just letting people know like we're gonna move on or here's the next slide. I, connecting it and using flow and focus um, interchangeably. Uh, another piece is um, asking if a new idea shows up or a topic, um, making sure that you're communicating that it could be saved for later, especially if you're trying to get, you know, through certain things and it might be a little bit longer of a conversation being able to let people know that there's space for that another time. Um, and a couple other things I have is just, you know, em emphasizing careful monitoring, uh, like Penny mentioned earlier too, like you have like um, a spring in your neck, like you're just trying to be aware of the bigger picture of how things are moving and being aware of the people, being aware of the space uh, and being aware of, of time and all the things. So paying attention to body language could be really helpful to tune into um, how people are absorbing information or being engaged in the space. Um, verbal cues, um, seeing how people are responding to certain things and also um, just offering different ways for participation and kind of like what we're doing today um, we have like little breakups of um, discussion and letting people have the opportunity to absorb the information and to keep the information focused. Um, and you also want to invite people to comment. Like I've, we've seen such great comments on the chat and uh, it's such a great opportunity to learn and also just um, see where people are at and, and how they're thinking about these conversations. Um, so yeah, it's, it is um, something to just be aware of and, you know, reflect on and improve on uh, over time. There's just going to be different dynamics in different spaces. And so figuring out how to maintain the flow and focus is going to be um, very situational. Um, but overall, just asking some of these questions and just reflecting in the moment and making sure that you're aware of what's going on around you is going to be really important. Um, and, and that was pretty, a pretty short one. And I um, am already going to give it back to, to Penny to talk a little bit about um, positions. Oh, you're muted, Penny. Sorry. Look at that. <laughs> gonna be on my, that's going to be on my gravestone. Penny, you're muted. Oh, let me, let me look at the comments actually really quickly. I see a couple of things popping up. Um, let's see. So slide, send to ask if slides will be available on ODOT website or will the facilitators send out to the attendees? And yes, we will be sending out via email. Right, Penny? Yep, yes. And somebody else had mentioned starting with step up, step back at the beginning of a meeting. And then someone else said, what is step up, step back? So I'm going to turn to, let me see, who said that? Uh, That's me. Go ahead, go ahead. Why don't you explain step up, step back for us? Yeah, I'm a step upper. So this has been a really good tool for me um, in meetings. It Depending on your usual communication style, you can... Um, dominate the airtime and then other people who usually step back and sit quietly 
um, don't really get to speak. Um, so at the beginning of the meeting where you might have personality types like that, you could say, listen, we're gonna do step up, step back today. So depending on your usual communication style, and if you're really verbal, maybe allow some others in the room to step up and you take a little step back. Um, and what's been really cool is a lot of the quiet people say what I was going to say anyway, and then I don't have to say anything. So it's pretty awesome. It's sure. Yeah, thank you, Kim, for sharing that. It's amazing when we, um, we actually intentionally change what we typically do and give space to others. Yeah, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just um, a random thought too is kind of connecting back to the group agreements. If you're, um, that's something I think that could be um, implemented or step up, step back can be something that's just a general rule of thumb in group agreements. Uh, just creating space for others, um, trying to just be aware of uh, that balance uh, and, and giving that accountability or having people be accountable to themselves and to the team. So um, thanks, Joey, and thanks, Kim. I'm going to move us on. Something that I get asked about a lot in terms of facilitation and, and how tools is how do we encourage good conversation and dialogue between people who are pretty stuck on their positions? Um, and so uh, I actually, were, this diagram that I have up in front of you, I got that from a trainer who trained me on public participation about 15 years ago, and it has stuck with me, and I have used it over and over and over again. And essentially what we're talking about here is um, position statements, positions, interests, and values. And so let me, let me explain this just a bit. Um, when we're talking about positions, we make position statements all the time. Um, uh, I hate ice cream. Um, I uh, I don't think that um, I don't think that tolling is tolling is a bad idea. Um, let's see. I hate paying taxes. Um, those are all position statements. And, and why are they position statements? They're just they're not opening any room for any conversation, any question. They are a definitive statement of what I think. Period end of discussion, right? That's the way a position statement feels to me. And so if you think of these two triangles that you're seeing, the purple triangle on the left and the orange triangle on the right, so you're looking at the biggest triangles, those are two people, okay, having a conversation. If each of them makes a position statement about something that is not in agreement, there's not much room for them to talk, to talk about it. Okay. So let me give you an example of that. Um, I worked on a project a long time ago with the Macaw uh, Indian tribe up in the uh, northwest corner of the state. And they are the only tribe in the lower US, lower 48 states that has uh, traditional whaling included in their treaty with the US government. So they have um, requested of the US government that they be allowed to resume whale hunting. And uh, it got a lot of publicity. This has been going on in the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s and, and so forth. And I was asked as a facilitator to um, facilitate some meetings about this. Well, let me tell you, I had a position. And my position going into that, which I never shared with anybody ever. So you are getting the first glance at a position from something that I did 15 years ago. My position was it's modern days, they shouldn't be allowed to whale. I just don't believe they should be whaling. And that was my position. And I went into that meeting, or all that series of meetings with that position. As a facilitator though, it didn't affect what I did because I was content neutral, right? But there were others who said, of course they should be allowed to whale, period. End of discussion. And so if the two of us tried to have a conversation about that, where's the commonality there? No, they can't whale. Yes, they can whale. How productive of a conversation can we have when we're talking in position statements? So what we're trying to do, you can see this space, the space between the two triangles above that first horizontal line, there's not much commonality there. If we move down to interest, 
we can actually find some space for agreement and the opportunity to have some discussions. And how do we go from position statements to interest? So you've got somebody making very declarative position statements. I don't believe they should be allowed to whale. And so I'm the facilitator, Penny. Why do you think they shouldn't be allowed to whale? And I say, well, because I don't think it's fair to the whales. I'm really worried about the whales. Now I'm stating my interest, right? That's not a, that's not a position statement anymore. It's an interest. I'm very interested in the whales. Someone over here says, why should they be allowed to whale? You, you ask that person, why should they be allowed to whale? Well, I'm very interested in them being able to maintain their culture and their traditional ways of living and carrying forward um, into the future what they've, you know, the values that they've always had. So now, look at this light purple space. There may be some space in there where we can actually have a productive conversation. There may not be yet, right? So maybe I want to get a little deeper. Penny, why are you concerned? What are you concerned about with the whales? Why are, you know, why, why are the whales so important to you? And I would say, well, I think all creatures should be protected. I think all creatures are important. And then they go over here and they ask this person to on, on the right, on the other position. Um, why do you think that they should, why is culture, their culture so important to you? And, and you can say, somebody might say, well, I really believe that, that the values of protecting all people and all species is really important to keep that alive. And suddenly we've got some value statements and we've got in the center there, that pinkish area, we've got some commonality, right? There are some shared values there. And that allows people to have productive conversations. They may not agree on their positions, but when you start digging and starting to get down to the why they're saying what they're saying, it allows room for exploration and trying to find commonalities. So what's the secret here of digging beyond position statements? First off, recognize the position statement when you hear it. If somebody's saying something in a very declarative fashion, and you could almost put an exclamation point at the end of it, you've got yourself a position statement. And chances are they don't expect anybody to change their mind. Then you can start by asking why. And that is the magic question. Just ask why and why and why. And when people get to the point where they can't answer that why anymore, they've given you a why and you've dug deeper and they've given you another one and you've dug deeper, and then they say, it just is, you've hit their value. And when you can get to that level and get people talking about their values, there's much more opportunity because we all share many, many, many basic values. And then it's a question of how can we find commonality in our values and can we find some ways to come to agreement based on talking about our values or at least understanding each other and not being in such dramatic opposition. So that's the key to digging beyond position statements. So as a facilitator, you want to watch for those. Because when you're asking people to have a conversation about a, a topic and, and you're getting a lot of position statements, there's not going to be much room for productive dialogue. So then you can say, oh, yeah, that sounds like a, a position statement. Let me do some digging. And you can just ask why. You know? Fred, can you share with the group why you think that's so important? Ethel, can you share with the group what it is about that position that you feel is so important to you? Why do you feel that way? And then it starts giving room for some conversation. So that's digging beyond position statements. The next one, if I could go to the next slide, I'm going to switch off again here. And I'm going to go to something else. Another, oh, look, I forgot my animations. Okay, here you go. Here's a statement that you might hear. Maybe, maybe not. I'm sick of you fat cats and your crooked cronies always throwing money to each other. You treat us like we're a bunch of dumb, broke, no goods, and you never go to bat for what we need. Wow. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Would you even say that that's maybe inflammatory? And have you ever heard even more inflammatory statements? Anybody? Raise your hand or give me a nod or something if you, you know. Heard some of these. I could have put more inflammatory in there that I've heard, but I didn't want to put them on a slide. <laughs> so I tried to not use foul language, and I tried to not use any um, any pejoratives that might harm anybody. So 
this is what I came up with. So um, what am I talking about here? One of the skills that as a facilitator we, um, we need to have is the ability to, and if I could have the next slide please, the ability to listen to people and rephrase and reframe what they say. Because sometimes you'll get statements like that. You'll get people saying things like that. And again, just like a position statement, there's not a lot of room for conversation about this, is there? This is pretty much an inflammatory, accusatory statement. And yet, there's important stuff underlying this, that statement. So here's what you want to think about. When you hear something like that, uh, or you want to just reframe what somebody said and, and show them that you're listening and that you hear them, you want to start with what was said. And so remember the quote was, I'm sick of you fat cats and your crooked cronies always throwing money to each other. You treat us like we're a bunch of dumb, broke, no goods, and you never go to bat for what we need. So that was what was said. What's the real issue? What's this person concerned about? Anybody want to jump in? What's the issue here? Nobody knows. Oh, Sierra. Um, I would say that they don't feel heard or acknowledged. Right, exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. And then what we wanna do is take that statement and reframe it to restate the core issue. So um, let me go back, can we go back one slide please? So here's the statement, right? Does anybody want to take a try at restating this? And by restating what are, and reframing, what we're saying is you might start your sentence with, so what I hear you saying is, and what is it you're hearing them say? And take the inflammation out of it. Take the heat out of it. What are you hearing them say? Anybody? Anybody want to take a shot at this? Is there anybody there? Okay, then I'll take a shot at it because I know you've been at this for a long time already this morning. So what I hear you saying is you have serious concerns about how we're allocating funding, how we're sharing our funding and how your interests are being supported. And maybe I'll even say it in a more simple fashion. Depends on how angry the person is. I hear that you're really concerned about the money and how it's being spent. I hear that you don't, you aren't paying any attention to us and our needs, right? What I'm doing is I'm taking the heat out of it, but I'm also saying, acknowledging, I'm hearing what their concern is. Because sometimes when people feel really passionately about something, the only way they know how to frame it is through an angry statement. And that doesn't mean we just dismiss things. It means that we have to find out what is it that they're really talking about. So as a facilitator, we're looking beyond the words and sometimes it's necessary to reframe and rephrase so that, um, so that um, they can uh, be felt like they're being heard. And then you can have a conversation about what the issues are. And it also helps the rest of the group because they don't know how to, how do they respond to this statement? I'm sick of you fat cats. They don't know how to respond to that. But if you reframe it and say, so what I'm hearing Fred say is that he has really serious concerns about how we're allocating funding. Let's have a conversation about that. Now you've made the issue more accessible to the rest of the people in the room, as well as acknowledging what Fred said. Okay, so that's reframing. It's not always about heated conversations. Can you go forward one slide, please, you know? Sometimes active and active listening, you're just reframing so that again, so people feel heard what was said, um, you know. So Janelle, I heard you say this, and then, and I think what I'm hearing is that your concern is about that, right? And is that, is that the case? And then let's have a conversation about that. So again, this is part of active listening, which is what we do as facilitators, is reframe back, state back to people what you think they heard and validate it and then uh, open the conversation. Okay, so that was a real quick introduction to reframing and restating and, re and rephrasing, but it's an important skill for us to have. Let's see. Next up, um, oh, my favorite one. Joey, managing disruptive participants, because we never have those, right? <laughs> Thanks, Penny. 
Uh, yeah, and we are running a tad behind schedule, so I'll be pretty quick here. Um, but yeah, I think what you're what you were going over, Penny, rephrasing and reframing, really um, it, it helps in this space of, of managing disruptive participants as well. Um, but you mentioned earlier that there were dominators, interrupters, and ramblers in terms of who's like the ways that people are disruptive in spaces. And like Penny was saying, there's there's a lot that somebody could be going through or not being heard, or there's like some core issue at hand. Um, but the ways that some people interrupt, it's just, um, yeah, you have to be proactive and you have to try to move, like hear them and be able to move forward. Um, but the first one is dealing with dominators. Um, so people who just um, talk a lot and have a lot of great things to share a lot of the time, or maybe not so great things to share, but just trying to create space to be patient as a facilitator. And if you observe someone who's dominating the space, uh, see if you can tell if the group has the essence of the dominator's point. So I guess figuring out where they're coming from and trying to help like that rephrasing kind of comes into play there and um, breaking that down. Um, if, if they, uh, if the group does get the point, then break in politely and note that there are a lot of people to hear from and see if you can direct to another person. Uh, another option is to say, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Uh, let's see what others think about this. Um, so just, yeah, that redirecting is, is gonna be really helpful there. Um, and then for dealing with interrupters, um, people who just, jump in when somebody else is talking or um, if you're in the middle of what you're saying or whatever during presentations. Um, if, if you observe this behavior repeatedly, uh, try to cut in and cut it short. Uh, so you can say, please hold that thought until we hear the rest of what this person was saying um, and trying to, to hold your ground in that space. Um, and then for how to deal with ramblers, uh, people who just go on and giving them some time to, you know, get what they want to say out and like trying to give them, I guess, like 10 seconds or so to let them try to finish their point. Um, but jump in if, if it's not getting to the point and thank them and redirect the question or conversation to someone else. And um, going back to that round robin idea, uh, that's that's a really great way to to just um, refocus, I guess, or like redirect some of that conversation to other people. Um, you can also just um, call on people, like Penny was saying, and, and just trying to find out, find ways to open the space up again. Um, and yeah, I think. That, I'm going to end there just for the sake of time. Thanks, Joey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we go to the next slide, it's my favorite, <clears throat> only because it's so archaic, but um, use of humor. Uh, I am very much a humorist, use humor a lot in my practice, and I have to be very, very thoughtful and very careful about my use of humor, and it has gotten me into trouble. Um, so um, the advantages of humor are, anybody want to give me an advantage? What's, what's the advantages of humor? Yes, right, thanks everybody for jumping in. I, it's great. Um, it, helps, uh, it helps liven up the room. It can help people feel comfortable with each other. Yep, somebody says breaks up tension. Uh-huh, yeah, it's right. And it can make people feel more in relationship with each other. But there are some big potential pitfalls um, for using humor. Um, cultural gaps. You can be, you know, humorous about something that is simply not humorous to somebody else and be completely unaware of that. If you're laughing at the expense of someone else, whether they're in the room or not, that's absolutely poor, poor, poor um, behavior. Um, there can be hidden sensitivities you simply don't know about. 
people may think you're not taking things seriously and, and, and you could actually lose some respect as a facilitator because they don't think that you are serious about the topics or the people or the process. So humor is, you know, it's, uh, it's a, I'm not saying you should start every meeting with a joke by any means. It is a tool just like everything else that we do. Some people are able to wield it with skill and others not. And regardless, um, it takes a lot of intentionality. You need to really be thoughtful about your humor. And it's taken me a lot of years to realize that I used to use humor like um, some people use too much salt. Um, I've learned that just like, you know, taking care of your salt keeps you healthy, so does being respectful about how much humor you use. Um, I did say, um, I did note that somebody said um, humor is, that laughing together unifies people and one they're using is um, 2020 just keeps getting better and better. Yeah, I think we can all make fun of 2020 because it does seem to be a shared experience and doesn't seem to be much hidden sensitivity about, about the impacts of 2020. So I'm, I'm totally with that. Just be thoughtful about it and mindful about humor. Don't, don't force yourself to try to be humorous just because you think it's a good tool to have. If it doesn't fall in your nature, it will feel cycled or you know, um, unreal, inauthentic. So um, just it's another thing to, to be mindful of. We have one more um, uh, group of things that we wanna just briefly talk about and then we're gonna make you work because that's what we love to do. Joey, online yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just really quickly on online facilitation. Um, you know, we're all learning and growing in the way we use Zoom. Um, and hopefully the ways that we've been engaging you all in the first and this first session and this session uh, with the annotation features and the polls and, and other activities. Um, there's just a lot of, I think, creative opportunity there in, in creating um, a, a unique space digitally and virtually. Um, but there, there's a lot of resources out there um, that are helpful for guiding you in, in the digital space. So like how to set up Zoom meetings, which can be pretty tricky. Like we had our poll um, issue earlier and you know just that flexibility, like we mentioned earlier is important. Um, but there is a guide online to help you set up meetings in, in the ways that you need them best. Like if you want the chat function on or if you want um, annotation and like just getting that all set up before the meeting and, and knowing what your opportunities are in the, in the Zoom space. Um, and oh, it says here that the, the first half of that document is on setup and the second half is on meeting feature. So that's gonna be a an awesome document for you all. Uh, another one is how to make your virtual meetings and events accessible, which we talked about a little bit today. And that's gonna be really important because there's a lot of things out there that we don't really know. Um, I mean, personally speaking, uh, and this comes into positionality a little bit, like I um, don't have any like large or uh, like um, physical disabilities. Um, and I do, I, I recognize that I need to have better understanding of like, what are some of those barriers like we mentioned before. So this is gonna be a good document to give you a little bit more of an idea of what uh, some of those opportunities are. And of course, always keep the dialogue open with members to really hear what their needs are um, because it is a very unique experience when, when you're trying to move through the different barriers that you experience on a daily basis. Uh, and then the last document um, for online facilitation is Leading Groups Online by Jean Rua and Daniel Hunter. Um, and this is another just good document to, to have an idea of, of what that space could look like. And then um, there is that other document at the bottom there, Anti-Oppression Facilitation Guide by Aorta. Uh, this isn't necessarily um, an online facilitation guide, but a general resource for facilitation um, to guide us on our um, intentionality, uh, like we've been talking about creating space for um, developing an equity lens in facilitation spaces, because there is a lot of dynamics that 
come into play like Penny had mentioned. So this is a good guide to kind of give you a, a different look of how to engage in facilitation. Um, so yeah, we'll leave those there for you and you can check those out uh, on when we send out the PowerPoint. Great. And so, um, yeah, giving back to Penny for our practice session. Thanks, Joey. I just wanted to note that Maria said that um, these online facilitation resources are useful, not just for advisor groups, but for staff and internal meetings. There's still lots of missed opportunities in recurring meetings to model good facilitation, even among people who are familiar with each other. And boy, howdy, that's for sure. And once you are a facilitator, there's nothing worse than having to sit through a meeting that's not your meeting and watching it be poorly led. It can be very frustrating. So, um, But let's move on because we want to give you a chance to get your hands wet or dirty or busy or something. I'm not sure what, but we want to do something. So we're going to do a small practice session. We have a small group assignment. We're going to use um, one of Zoom's famous features, which is our breakout groups. So may I have the next slide, please? What we're going to ask you to do, and uh, we're going to put you into small groups, um, and here's, here's what we're going to do. Jan uh, Janelle is going to drop a document into chat. So she's going to drop a link into the chat here. And we'd like you all to click on that link and open that document and then download a local copy. So open the, it's just a one page Word doc. Jo Joey has the link to that. And he's going to put it in chat. Sorry about that, Janelle. Nothing like asking you to do something that you don't have. Um, so anyway, there's the link in the chat. So if you would download that, we want you to have a local copy because we don't want you all working on the exact same document. Then we're going to put you into small groups. And someone in the small group is going to share their screen. Just one of you needs to do it, but just share your screen and show that document. So in that document has the directions for a meeting that you're going to plan. And we've given you an agenda table. We'd like you to design the agenda for a meeting. And then uh, we'll bring you back in about 15 minutes and have you tell us a little bit about how the meeting is going to go. So if I could have the next page, uh, the next slide, please. I think we have the document, oh, back up. I guess we don't. I thought we had the document to share. So the instructions are in the document. So have a few people of you downloaded that document? Nods, yes, okay, good. All right, so Janelle, could we do a random break everybody into groups and let's do it so that we have about five people in a group? Yes, great and, uh, Excellent, so everybody go to your groups and um, design us an agenda. Thank you so much. See you in your small groups. And folks should be seeing a pop-up of a window inviting you to your breakout room. And if you have issues with that, please let me know.
Hello and welcome back everybody. I don't know about you guys, but I had a ball in my group. <laughs> so anybody struggle with this or was this easy? Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Um, I'm usually a person that really needs to, time to digest something, uh, text, right on the fly, and uh, you know, and I really appreciate you know people. I like working with people who are much more adept at that. But I did have to ask for the group to help me get to the same place where they are mm -hmm. so that I could participate. And, every, and that worked out well, I thought. Good, excellent. Well, that's, um, that's where our teammates can help us. You know, we, we always want diverse teammates because we can all shore each other up, right? Places where we're strong and others are not. Great. Yeah. Anyone else? And just really quickly, I was in Rebecca's group, and I just thought it was awesome, Rebecca, you asking and asserting your needs and, you know, trying to problem solve so that you could participate. And, um, yeah, I, I'm along with you in, in trying to digest and overthinking things, so I, I totally relate. But, yeah, great job at um, saying what you needed and, and um, working through that. And... Yeah, like to what to Penny's point, it was a great opportunity to. Um, it's it's a it's a community effort, right? We're all in this together, so allowing different perspectives. Okay, any anybody? Thank you, Joey, and thank you, Rebecca. Anybody else uh, want to share anything from that session? Old hat, right? The reason that we did that like that is we just want you to be really thoughtful about developing your agendas. The agenda is one of the most important tools you're going to use. And you really have to ask yourself, you really, you really have to say, what are our objectives? This points out, what are we driving towards? What are we trying to accomplish with this meeting? And as a facilitator, you need a map to know where you're going and what your when you, how do you know when you're there? And that's what the agenda does. It gives you that map and, and uh, allows you to understand your mileposts and, and when do you have to stop and get gas, right? That would be called a break. <laughs> um, and, and understand uh, what, what, you know, how your committee is doing on achieving their purpose. So um, thank you for doing that. We really appreciate it. I can see that our group has shrunk. It usually does when we get near the end of a session, and that's okay. Um, before we go to closing, I just really quickly, um, I, I wanted to um, just see if there were any last questions that you had about um, uh, how to facilitate or some situations that you really are puzzled about. I noticed that Kim said, I could use some practice at time management. Guesstimating amount of time is hard. And someone else noted that as well. I can tell you that time management is tricky. And I'm always struggling with my sponsors because they say, oh, this is the 10 minute agenda item or the better one. This is a five minute agenda item. And I'm like, I don't do five minute agenda items. My rule of thumb, I don't do them. Because number one, Presenters always go long. Number two, sponsors think, oh, this is a no-brainer. We'll just say this and then everybody's gonna be fine with it. And there's always somebody that has either questions or has an issue or something. So, uh, you know, allow more time than you think you need. What's worse, to not get through an agenda or to get through your agenda early? Yeah, right? And people hate it. They hate it if you get a meeting done early. Now, if it's only, you know, you're 10 minutes into the agenda and you're done, I mean, you're 10 minutes into the meeting time and your two-hour meeting is done, you've got a problem. But um, I, I don't worry too much about going short. I worry too much about going long. So I rather put more time for an agenda item than less. If you're consistently finding that, you know, you're looking at it over time and realizing every time I say this is a half an hour agenda item, it may take 20 minutes, 
you can start to make adjustments that way and, and know that and, and lessen your cushion. But yeah, time management, time management is tricky and, and sponsors think that they can cram 72 topics into a meeting. And um, you, you know, don't, <laughs> don't let them do it. <laughs> so um, I'm hoping that we shed some light on what your role and purpose is as convener, um, planner, facilitator, um, recruiter, um, troubleshooter, and all of those kinds of things as you uh, do your work associated with um, facilitation. We, um, we wanted to leave you with this last word of advice, and that is um, don't make assumptions about anything. If you have any doubts about something, check it out. Um, you know, if you're questioning whether you should bring a topic up, you know, look into it. If you're questioning about how long it's going to take, be thoughtful and talk with your sponsors about, you know, what, what do you think are the pitfalls of this item? Um, there are plenty of resources on the web. We found a ton of them um, and we know you can find them as well. Look hard and read, do some reading about facilitation. It doesn't, it doesn't replace the real practice. But get the opportunity to watch if you are new to facilitation, take the opportunity, find the opportunity to watch other facilitators and see how they do it, see what you learn. See what, oh, that's a good thing. I do that all the time. I learn all the time and put little tips and tricks in my toolbox from watching other facilitators. Um, one of them that is a really great one that I haven't taught myself to do yet, but um, is when you're having a discussion, Janelle, could you stop sharing the screen? Could you stop? stop sharing the PowerPoint presentation for a second. Look at that. Suddenly now I have everybody on camera in front of me and you all are looking at each other instead of looking at a slide. And so if I want you all to have a discussion, this is a way better way of having the discussion. And I forget to do this. And I saw another facilitator do, she does this so effortlessly. So she's always going back and forth between slides in this gallery view. And when she wants to have a discussion, she turns the slide off. And um, it's a great tip. And if you're you know, really struggling to get your people engaged with each other, do this because it helps them. They see each other and they can talk to each other instead of being distracted by the slide. Um, so that's a tip that I share with you that I'm still struggling to learn. As you see, I didn't do it once today, but it just came back into my brain. All right, so um, we did want to check back in. So we asked you at the beginning of the um, session a question about how comfortable you felt uh, as a facilitation. Joey, can you read that question again for us, please? Sure. Uh, so how confident are you planning and faci facilitating advisory groups? Not confident, somewhat confident, confident or very confident. And so I would ask you, did we move the dial at all? Did it help you feel just a little bit more confident or did we go in the wrong direction and now you're like, oh my God, there's so much to think about, I can't do it. <laughs> I don't wanna know that. Um, but um, I'm hoping that we help move the dial a little bit and, and help show that it's a lot about being thoughtful. It's a lot about paying attention and giving yourself the time to really plan a meeting, think through it. One of the things that I find is when I hurry, if I don't give myself ample preparation time, it makes the meeting harder. So, so always do that. And with that, if uh, we could go on to the very last slide, please. Um, we would like to leave you, thank you, with our emails, uh, I'm pmady at envirations.com, Joey is jo Jay Posada at envirations.com, and Janelle is the same, Jay Hull at envirations.com, surprise, surprise. Um, feel free to email us uh, any questions that are lingering after this session. We're happy to um, provide follow-up. We also will be providing both uh, PowerPoint presentations from last week and this week. We're gonna mail them out, to, or email them out to everyone. We'll also provide them and the recordings. We recorded both sessions to Marsha. I'm not sure where they're going to be um, stored or shared or whatever, but they'll have them. So Marsha and uh, and uh, Jamie, I think, um, will figure out where they're going to be, and then we'll let y'all know where those are. So thank you so much for spending your time with us today and last week. Those of you who were on both sessions, we really appreciated it and loved sharing some of our experiences and, and knowledge with you. Um, and with that, 
Uh, unless there's any final questions, Joey, any final words? No, just thank you everyone. I had a great opportunity getting to know some of you in both sessions. Uh, it was such a fun time and um, yeah, these are always great opportunities to connect. And thank you to all who were saying thank you to us, especially Caitlin, my New Hampshire buddy. Um, <laughs> hope you have a great rest of the day, <laughs> Caitlin. Hope you have a great rest of the day and uh, hope we get to run into each other again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank Good you. Night.